My name is Jason Clausen. For those of you who are new here, just visiting, one of the pastors here at the Open Door Church. And I'm pumped you could be here. We finished uh, last week with a, serv- uh, sorry, a series that took us uh, seven weeks to get through, actually. And we're just starting a new one. And we actually won't be going through it continuously. You'll be getting little, little uh, repeated hits of this throughout the coming winter. Uh, but I want to start the series this Sunday uh, by, by addressing some things. So if you're new here, that's great. You're, you're on the ground floor. It's lucky that you're here. Um, we're not going to tackle everything. This will be a big topic. We'll, we'll take our time to walk through it. Um, but we're going to just, just dive in and get a little sampling of it this morning. February 26th, 2015, something terrible happened. And it divided fathers against children, mothers against daughters, Nations were on the brink of war. It seemed like the whole world held its breath in anticipation of the answer of one deep fundamental question. What was the color of a stupid dress? And if you were somehow in a coma for the last year or don't know what www.anything.com means, then you might not know what that is. It's a picture of a dress, obviously. See, what happened was February 26th, uh, Grace and Keir Johnston were about to get married. They're a Scottish couple. They were about to get married. And Grace's mother, Cecilia, was looking for a dress for the mother of the bride. And she snapped a poorly framed, poorly lit picture of a dress and sent it to them and said, what do you think? Should I wear it? Should I not? And the weirdest conversation ensued for them. And we're going to try to sample it. Um, If that dress looks blue and black to you, please stand. Stand up if it's blue and black. Okay. Now sit down. If that dress looks white and gold to you, please stand. What? 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 It's obvious it's what? Lynn has a question. What? You you, you like to stand. You're just holding a kid. Oh, that's a good reason. I thought you had a question about the dress. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See, that's the thing that happened. Grace and Kier, or, uh, yeah, Grace saw it as white and gold, and Kier saw it as blue and black. And they had the weirdest conversation where they couldn't figure out how they were talking about the same thing. They were looking right at it. And she kept apparently saying, look at it, it's white and gold. And he would say, well, look at it, it's blue and black, and back and forth. So they sent the picture to their bridesmaids, because, of course, the groomsmen would be useless in solving this decision, but the bridesmaids might help. And asked them what the color of the dress was. But she put it on Facebook and just tagged their names in it. So it's public now, right? Well, within two days, there had been 9 million tweets. I don't know what the Facebook count was. And by the end of the week, it was on... CNN had two people, two news anchors, dedicated to following the dress conversation. Like, I don't know how much money was spent on this, but this became massive because they couldn't figure out what the color of this dress was. And there's two reasons why. Well, there's more than that probably, but then boredom might be a factor, but two main reasons why. We're not used to having arguments about obvious color or things that you can just look at and see. And number two, there have been fringe cases like this before, but you know, when there's 10 of you together and two of you see something, and well, they're outliers, they're the idiot friends who don't know what chartreuse or fuchsia means anyway, and so they don't count, or whatever. You can kind of sideline them. But on the internet, it was public, and it was very evenly divided. Statistically, 57% see the dress as blue and black. And about 30% see it as clearly white and gold. And then there's a weird 10% that see blue and brown, and they're just wrong. (laughs) And then there's about another 10% who can switch at random or at will between any of the colors. That just confuses me. So it's a fairly even split. It wasn't something you could just discount and ignore. And, and so I want to show you a picture of the real dress. This is the real dress in proper lighting. It, it's blue and black. It is certifiably blue and black. Here's the problem. It doesn't matter. The question was, what's in the picture? And in the picture, there is no right answer. It's whatever you see. And and I can look at that white and gold, slash blue and black, slash whatever picture, all I want, and I know the real dress is really blue and black, and I can't make myself see it, because I see it as white and gold. I'm, I'm one of those guys. I see it as white and gold. I'm sorry. And that's the problem right there. 
I know what I'm supposed to be seeing, but I can't see it. And I, and I, and I don't argue like I'm wrong. I mean, when I first saw that, I didn't realize what was going on, and somebody said it was blue and black, and I was like borderline upset with them, because clearly it's not. And this happened like a hundred times throughout the next, uh, next week. We can argue, and we can debate, and we can point to evidence, and we can hash it out, and we can burn bridges, and we can fight, thinking that we're right about some dress. The problem is seeing isn't believing. Perceiving is believing. Whatever you perceive is what you believe. And you can argue and point to whatever you want to, but I'm looking right at it, and you're looking right at it, and we're just seeing two different things. Now, what's going on here? Let's break this down. The next picture is a little bit less ambiguous, right? What do you see? What do you see? Shut it out. Gray and white. Top square is gray, bottom square is white, right? Is anybody in disagreement? Nobody other than Lindsay who I'm not going to call on. No, it's not actually uh, gray and white. It's gray and gray. Want to show that next picture? It's gray and gray. It's the same shade. Top and bottom is the same shade. In fact, if I would cover that little, little stripe in the middle there, you'd see they're identical, 100% identical shade. It's gray and gray. What seemed almost black and white is actually the same shade of gray. See, but it turns out absolute color, which is, you know, if you use a color picker on your computer or something like that, absolute color is useless to our heads. Because you see two things that are gray, but one of them is in deep shade and one of them is under bright light, and they look the same. Your brain says, okay, they look the same, yes, but they're not, right? The thing that's in bright light and looks gray is probably dark gray. And the thing that looks gray but is in, in the shade is probably white plus some shade on it, making it look gray. And so your brain says, no, 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 one's white, one's black. I know they look the same. But you don't care about that. You just care about what they probably actually are. So your brain makes its best guess. And it's super good at this. Like, it's really, really, really good at figuring out what the real color is. Because we can turn these, these lights red. We can turn them blue. We can turn them whatever. And you'll still know I'm wearing a black shirt and that that guitar is kind of a light tan color. You can still figure all of that out. Brain's really good at that. Until it's not, as we saw with the color of the dress. When it comes to the world, perceiving beats seeing every time. Two people can perceive the exact same things from different angles, and they're looking at it, and they're staring at it, and they're talking about it, and they're fighting about it, but depending on what angle you look at it from, it just looks different, and that's the problem. We trust our sight because we think we're seeing neutrally, but we aren't. The act of sight is the act of making a judgment about the world around us. The act of sight is the act of making a judgment about the world around us. It's the act of taking many conflicting, difficult points and trying to make something cohesive. We don't see, we perceive, and perceiving is believing. We don't act that way. We don't act like there's even a hint we might be wrong. Do we? We just barrel down, double down, and, and we're right. We're obviously right because we're seeing it with our own eyes. One time I divided my small group, I had a small group, and I divided them in half. And I said it was a competition, a timed competition. And I told half of them to list as many farm animals as they could in whatever it was, a minute. And the other half, I told separately, to list as many sea animals in, in a minute as they could. And then I brought them back together, and I showed them this picture, and I asked them if they'd had that animal listed. And they both said yes. And I said, Really? And then they start to fight about it. Because if you were doing the farm animals, you're saying, well, you can't possibly have had a donkey amongst the sea animals. And if you're doing sea animals, you said, well, you can't possibly have had a seal amongst the farm animals. And they fought about it until you realize those are either the ears of a donkey or the flipper of a seal. And that's either the face of the seal or the mouth of the donkey. It's the same picture, right? But depending on how I had primed them, they saw it as one way or the other way. And even after I said, the guy who drew this He meant it to be ambiguous. Whatever they first saw was somehow correct, at more correct at the very least, and whatever the other people saw was somehow less correct. And even though they knew there was no correct answer, once you've seen something a certain way, it's hard to unsee it that way. Your past and your history and how you're primed determines how you perceive. And if this can happen with dresses and cubes and donkey seal pictures that are really simple... 
how much more can this happen with the Bible? It actually seems like that might be a little bit of a tricky thing, because it's a lot bigger and more complicated. And I'm just going to take one simple example. 1 Peter 3, verse 1, the first half. In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. That word to wives, to submit, it's right there. You can't get around it. You can't read the Bible without seeing this right there. Everybody sees it. If you've ever read your Bible, you've seen this. And, and it makes it even more complicated because it's obvious what it means. I mean, it's obvious in the context of that verse that the word to wives to submit means... We can all... Thanks, Kev. We can all finish that different ways, can't we? We can finish that a lot of different ways. I have heard 10 different preachers preach on this 10 different ways. How did that just happen? It's so clear. It's right there. Yeah, and yet... The Bible says is the best way to start an argument with somebody. Just is. Sorry. Because we don't see, we perceive. And perceiving is believing. We're told that we see the world through our eyes, but that's completely false. Our eyes take pictures of the world, but we see the world through our brain. That seems like I'm maybe semantically arguing here, but there is something like 30 to 32 steps from when the light hits your eyes till you get a picture in your brain. And at each one, you're, you're parsing down information. You're trying to guess what's relevant and what's irrelevant. You're trying to package things in neat little boxes and make sense of it all. And at each of those 30 to 32 steps, you're losing a lot of information. And I can prove it right off the hop. Now, if you're wearing glasses, you just touch the top of your eyelid. Just, just lightly, like don't squeeze. Just touch. And look to the corner, like just look to the side of the room, and then scan to the other side, back and forth a little bit. Y'all look really silly right now. This is awesome. <laughs> what you're going to notice is your eye doesn't scan smoothly, does it? It jumps. <laughs> it makes discrete jumps. And depending on, on uh, how your muscles are aligned, two, three, or four jumps goes from far right to far left. Bang, 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 bang. It jumps. You can feel the little, little flickers. But when you scan your head from left to right, or scan your eyes from left to right, you don't see those jumps. You see a nice smooth motion, don't you? Your brain's not even getting a movie like we see in our head. Your brain's getting discrete pictures of the world, and it stitches a movie together out of that. So right off the hop, you're not even seeing the whole world. If something happens when your eye jumps, you don't even see it. You don't even get that information. So you start off at a disadvantage. We don't see the world with our eyes. We perceive the world with our brains, and then we think we've seen it as it actually is. It's tricky. It's really, really tricky. When you're babies, you don't have a lot of that same hardware. Or actually, you have too much hardware, and your brain has to parse down what's not really that important. And so babies are terrible at recognizing faces. They, they can hardly do it. And as we get older, we start to learn faces are super important because they're tied to people. They're the best way to identify people. And different people treat us very differently. And so faces become one of the most important things our brain does. And so our brain becomes essentially like one giant face-making machine where we can catch all the faces. I mean, I, can, I, I uh, ran into somebody a couple weeks ago in a Home Depot who I have seen maybe a dozen times. I can't remember her name because I'm terrible with names. I saw her from the back and the side of her cheek, and I could already see what the face was. My brain could make that face because we're that good in bad light and weird angles at making faces until we overcompensate and people see faces of Mother Mary and toast and you see faces in the clouds and you can see, uh, if you go up close to uh, like Abraham Lincoln there on, uh, at um, uh, R Mount Rushmore, I've been to Mount Rushmore, you have, it doesn't look like a face, it's a bunch of jagged blasted edges from dynamite. Looks like a face from a distance because our brains are really good at making faces. We learn that. And the point of all of this is that the history we come from and our expectations Determine what we perceive and the way we perceive it. The history we come from and our expectations determine what we perceive. Our past and our expectations change what we perceive. Back to that dress, which you're all tired of already. Almost exclusively, only young teens and kids can switch between blue and black or gold and white. If you're older than about 15, you can't switch. 
because your brain is constantly learning how to, how to factor in the light from around as far as how it affects colors. When you're younger, your brain's still trying to guess and learn, and so it's adapting all the time. When you get older, you fall back on what you're comfortable with, what your brain's always done, what's been right before, and you stop trying to adapt. That doesn't scare you. I don't know what should. Perhaps that's why the, the psalmist, when he's talking about God's word, about the Bible, says, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wonderful things from your instructions. Open my eyes. Because if our eyes aren't open, we're not seeing, we're perceiving based on our history and our expectations. And then Paul says to Timothy, Consider what I say. Well, that's good. We still consider what Paul says. Consider what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. It takes careful consideration and the Holy Spirit working in us to change our perception for God's word to mean anything of value to us or else we just perceive what we've always perceived and think we're seeing the world. We need God to change the way we look at the Bible if we actually want to know what God's word is saying and have it relevant to us. And it's not just black and white and funny dresses and seal donkey pictures. Um, that, that next picture up there, uh, it's a bunch of interconnected chains, right? A lot of nodding heads. It's not. They don't touch. It's actually a series of four concentric circles that no place touch. But you try to look at that thing and it's all just crisscrossy knots, isn't it? Except for Wilf, he sees it as a bunch of circles, so good for Wilf. He's got special eyes. It's all a bunch of interconnected circles. It's changed. Our brain sees things as connected and related and intertwined where they're not. We do this all the time. We see things as connected where they're not connected. We make links where they're not links. We take Bible verses and we string them together to say things they weren't meant to say. How do we do this? Well, let's say you're applying for a job. A job you really want. And, and you're nervous. And so that morning you open your Bible and it just kind of falls open. Right there is Philippians 4 verse 13. It just kind of jumps out at you. And it says, I'm able to do all things through he, him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Getting this job is a thing. It's a thing. And I can do it because he's strengthening me. And he's strengthening me so I can do it. I can get this job because he is strengthening me. I'm going to name it. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to get this job. It's done. Hey, it is done. That's actually also a verse. It is done. Oh, it's done. Hallelujah, Jesus' name, I have this job already. I hate to break it to you, but that verse wasn't written about your job application. It wasn't. But, but doesn't it feel like it was? Doesn't it really, really feel like it was? Until you don't get the job and then your faith is rattled because you were so sure and then you didn't. And look, I, and I want to tell you right up the I'm not saying God doesn't care about your job application. And I'm not saying that the Bible can't speak to your circumstances. What I'm saying is we have to be very careful when we pick and choose which verses are overlapped. It's like the old one about the person who pulled open the Bible and it says, and Judas went and hung himself and then opened the Bible to another place and it says, and Jesus says and go do, do likewise. You can't just cherry pick at random. It says some pretty crazy things then. You have to look at the context of what it meant. You have to understand what God's saying. You have to let the Holy Spirit guide you into what he's saying. Because maybe, maybe, maybe God wants you to stay where you are. Maybe even though it's a boring or a bad job or you've got an annoying boss or it'd be more money at the other place, maybe God's trying to teach you perseverance. Or he's trying to teach you to trust him in all circumstances. Or, or maybe who knows what. But you can't just open the Bible and start finding random links to things. Finding connections where there are no connections. It takes wisdom and the spirit to make careful perceptions about the Bible. We don't just get to pick and choose. You notice how we always pick and choose something that agrees with us? I mean, nobody ever says, I just opened my Bible and completely disagreed with me and I've changed my worldview. It always seems to agree with us or be positive or uplift. God's always speaking to us through the Bible, and the Bible is an incredibly, incredibly useful place to find life information. But we have to take it with, a, with an understanding of everything. In Joshua 1 verse 8, wonderful, wonderful verse. It says, This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. 
You are to receive it day, recite it day and night, so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. Not just the part that happens to be convenient that looks like it's related to your life, but everything. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. It, isn't that what we want? We want to prosper and succeed in what we do. We want to see the kingdom of God come in our lives and, and the breaking of old chains and addictions and habits and patterns and the healing of broken relationships. And, and we want to see kingdom authority and power happening in our lives. And that happens when we go to the Bible with the guidance of the Holy Spirit asking God to teach us what it means. Not just defaulting on old patterns that seem to connect but asking God what matters. You've seen this next picture. And I really hope that the optical illusion works if you're a little bit further back. If you're closer, it's really, really trippy. Because as you scan around, the whole thing's spinning on you. And if it doesn't work for you, go look on YouTube later on today or tomorrow when this is up on the sermon. And stare at your screen, and the whole thing's spinning on you all the time. But it's a completely stationary image. And the reason why this works is the same thing I was talking about before when you're scanning right to left. The little jumps that your eye is making. What's happening is your eye makes little jumps back and forth around on that screen. And you start seeing the colors from different angles. And what your brain tries to do is guess what's happening. Is my eye moving or is the picture moving? And the picture is cleverly designed to trick your brain into getting it wrong. And you think the whole image is moving, but actually it's your eye that's moving this time. And it's useful for your eye to move. It's useful to, to shift around like that because you get slightly different snapshots and angles of the same thing. And your brain can use that to stitch together something, kind of a, a better, complete analysis of the object from slightly different angles. But sometimes it can trick us and get us wrong. It can make things that are shifting seem solid or make things that are solid seem shifting. And we can make solid things seem changeable and changeable things seem solid. We do this all the time. It happens in our approach to religious and biblical things all the time. That we take things that were meant to be solid and we change them. And we take things that were meant to be changeable and we make them solid. We make a law or a rule around it. I work with this guy. Wonderful guy. A uh, really old-fashioned guy. Anyway, um, he believed, for instance, that tattoos were evil. Uh, completely evil. And, and here's, here's what he You might not like tattoos, but he believed they were a sin. Leviticus 9.28, he says, you are, You're not to make gashes on your body for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourself. I am Yahweh. It even says on the end, I am Yahweh, just in case you were wondering who said that. Can't have tattoos. They're sins. He believed the entire Levitical law still applied to him. So he didn't eat pork, and he didn't eat shellfish. He, um, if he planted a fruit tree, he wouldn't harvest fruit for the first three years, and on the fourth year, he'd have to give it to the Lord, because only on the fifth year could you eat the fruit, or else it was sinful. Um, he didn't believe in getting house or car insurance, because uh, that was like gambling, and gambling was wrong in the Bible, so he wouldn't have car or house insurance, and on and on and on and on. Uh, let not bone pierce cloth meant he couldn't have buttons, so he had his coveralls had to be specially made so they didn't have buttons, and it, it was intense. And the guy believed all of it. And it's easy to poke fun at, because that's so backwards. Ha, 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 we don't do that. And then we argue about what kind of clothing you can wear to church, and we argue about how long the candles have to be to sit on the altar, and we argue about what kind of music is godly, and what's not godly, and are hymns godly, or is praise music, or a chorus is godly, can you have drums in church, and we argue about the stupidest things that were blue in the face, because they were right for a season, or a culture, or a time, and then the season, or the culture, or the time changed, and we made them solid. It happens all the time. It's sneaky. Because they were right once. And then th something changed. And it's hard to change. And then they stay right forever. And we make things solid that were meant to be changeable. And we make things changeable that were meant to be solid. And it's easy to pick on the person who's like so far, like three or four generations out of date, that we don't really see how that happens to us. I was at a liturgical Eucharist supper last night. I enjoyed myself. I 
just couldn't stand to be in a liturgical church. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But here's the thing. I know that's me. It's my personality. I wasn't made to be in a liturgical service scenario. I mean, I could deal with it, but it's just, it's just not me. There's nothing wrong with it. And there's many, many people who it speaks to deeply and rich. And the, the tapestry of the service speaks life. And, and the spirit moves for them. And, and then for me, it doesn't as much. And I, that's just me. It's not wrong. They're not evil. And I'm not evil for being in a, in a more charismatic free church. And if you raise your hands and yell hallelujah, you're not sinning. It, it just depends on your culture to some extent. There are things that are about your personality and about your culture that just, they're not that solid. But I can go find a verse that'll make everything a sin or make everything permissible depending on how I want to read it. And I can do it if I'm letting my eyes, my brain trick my eyes. Because perceiving is believing. And we make things solid into things that are changeable. You're going to say, out your amen here. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9. We just cherry pick, don't we? We like the first half. We like, we like Corinthians 9 here. Don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the, God, the God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people. I always get this wrong here. Idolaters and adulterers. Idolaters or adulterers. Hard to say. Or anyone practicing homosexuality. Well, you know, here's the thing. In the church, we don't worship a lot of idols. And I mean, adultery seems just on the face of it wrong. You know, sexually more, I mean, people with uh, porn problems or, 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 or perverts, and of course they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Those are clearly bad things. And we, we make a theology out of that first half of that list, and we, we're so sure we've got it exactly right. And then we never stop to read verse 10, do we? Because it gets awfully personal. No thieves. Oh, okay, I get that. Greedy people are on that list. So like if I have a house, but I'm unhappy and I want a better house, I'm on that list. Drunkard, you drink too much, you're on that same list. We kind of throw that one out. Verbally abusive people. If somebody's not around and you trash them, you're on that same list. You have a bad day and you, you tear a strip off the cashier or the gas attendant, you're on that list. You lose your temper at your kids, you're on that list. How'd that happen? That was an accident. God didn't actually mean that. That's changed over time. The first half is solid. That last half, maybe it's changed over time. Uh, or swindlers. You ever double build somebody on purpose? Or not paid a bill and hope they wouldn't find out? Or uh, fudge a little bit of the numbers on a tax receipt on the list? It's the same list, but we treat the first half and the second half completely different because it's convenient, I'm guessing. I don't know. They will not inherit God's kingdom. We cherry pick. We cherry pick the things that apply to other people. And we, we like to focus on God's grace when it applies to us. And that's how we do it. We, we make things shifty. So we find connections where there weren't supposed to be any. And we think things are black and white when they're not. Or we think things are black and white when they're not. We change things up. We do this all the time because our brain is constantly trying to make sense of so much information. And here's the thing. That sounds scary. It does sound scary. Here's what it means. Really practical. Read your Bible lots and carefully and all of it, not just the parts you feel happy with. Number two, take what you've learned with a grain of salt, realizing I could be wrong. I believe I'm right, but I could be wrong. Number three, apply it to yourself first and rigorously before you dare apply it to someone else. That's a hard one right there. I know that's a hard one. Apply it to yourself. So when you read something, you want to apply it. Ask first, how can I apply it to me? Not, oh, who should I Facebook message this verse to? That thing about not gossiping. I'm going to send it to that friend who's, no, no, no. Apply it to yourself first. Why? Be graceful with the people around you and recognize we're all on a journey and we're all fallen and we're all broken. And be graceful, be encouraging primarily. Lift people up. Pick them up when they fall down. When you think somebody's got it wrong, pray for them. Try to be a blessing to them. Don't use the Bible like a club.
And finally, and finally, and finally, and most importantly, don't you dare, don't dare approach the Bible without asking the Holy Spirit for wisdom and guidance because we have to understand we're not seeing things as they are. We're perceiving them through our brain and we're not always right. We, we have blind spots. We have issues. We have our past and our expectations change the way we see the Bible. The, the culture you were raised in, the culture you left, the, the thing you thought you left when you were a kid, it's still there somewhere in the back of your head. It's a blind spot for you. But God is bigger than all of that. All of that. John 16, verse 13. This is the key verse here. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Not your thought, not your study, not your Bible study, not your... It's the spirit of truth that will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. And that's the thing. It's easy to read the Bible. It's very hard to read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and to try to follow what the Holy Spirit's saying as you do. So I have an easy and obvious challenge for you this week. Invite the worship band to come up. Here's the challenge. I want to invite you to read the Bible for like a couple of minutes a day. I'm talking like 10 minutes. If you read the Bible more, that's fantastic. But if you don't ever pick up your Bible, we can start with 10 minutes a day. That's actually a lot of stuff you can learn in 10 minutes. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of growth. God can speak volumes. 10 minutes a day. But here's the deal. Before you do, I want you to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to guide you, to to break your assumptions. Start in the Gospels. It's a great place to start. But don't come to the Gospels with what you think you're going to see. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants to show you, what's there. It's speaking to you. It's rich. It's full of power to change your life and the lives of those around you. But power is also dangerous, and so ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth, not just the convenient truth. And then read your Bible. And ask God to speak to you what he has to speak to you. I invite you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, right now, I just want to invite you into our lives, invite you into our minds. Lord, I know I, we, all, everybody, we have these deep-seated, hard-built, hard-fought-for understanding of, of what you meant in your word, God. But Lord, right now, I just want to bring them to you. Lord, I want to ask you to... Lord, we've raised up false, false idols and false altars, God, that you would bring them down. Lord, that you would invade our hearts and our minds right now, that your spirit would come. Lord, as we commit right now as a church to reading our Bible this week in a... In a in a fresh and enlightened way. Lord, I ask that your spirit would be poured into our minds right now, breaking those old assumptions. Lord, where where family history and old church traditions and, and things that just seem right to us get in the way of seeing the word, Lord, I pray you would wash them away in your loving care. And God, I pray that you would help us to see what you meant. Lord, to see others through your eyes, to see the Bible through your eyes. Lord, I pray that it would become real to us, it become transformational to us. Lord, right now, I just want to rebuke that spirit of cherry-picking what's convenient. Lord, I just want to rebuke that spirit of seeing things as as clearly black and white and using them as clubs against other churches and and other non-believers, Lord. And I want to invite you to, in all humility, lead us into a new understanding of your truth. Lord, refresh our minds and our hearts and our eyes. Pray all of this in your precious name. Amen.